Year 10 and 11, welcome to your analysis of the prelude by William Wordsworth in preparation for your AQA English Literature Poetry Exam. William Wordsworth is one of the most famous poets in the history of English literature. He is a romantic poet. A romantic poet focuses on nature and human emotion. That is really important to the poem The Prelude because it shows us what the poem will be about, nature and emotions. So what is the poem about? The poem is about the speaker finding a boat and taking it out on the lake. The speaker is happy, self-assured and admires the beautiful scene. The speaker sees a mountain on the horizon and becomes afraid of its size and power. He turns the boat around and goes home, but his views have changed. The structure of the poem. The poem uses free verse. Free verse is often used in epic poems about mighty subjects, but here it describes a personal journey. The poem also uses the iambic pentameter. The first person narrative makes it sound personal and we hear the, at first hand the speaker's thoughts and feelings. The use of free verse signifies the speaker is in a serious dialogue about his experience. It has an undertone of importance. As the poem progresses, we realise that the, the free verse signifies the speaker's change. The speaker's change in emotion. The fact that he goes from happy and self-assured to frightened. Perhaps the free verse even signifies the power of nature. The poem also uses enjambement, which allows the poet's feelings to overflow. They become powerful. We are unable to stop the speaker from explaining his emotions. The prelude is viewed as an epic poem. Epic poems are very long pieces of writing that usually deal with exciting, action-packed, heroic events. Although many of the events word, words with rights about are ordinary, they are given an epic quality to fully describe the impact, impact they have on his life. So, for instance, the viewing of the mountain and how the mountain changes word, words with views. The prelude also uses the volta, and that means a turn, a turn in thought. It was usually indicated by words such as but, yet, or and yet. We will speak about the Volta as we analyse the language within the poem. Okay, if we go through language and we'll just do a little section at a time. One summer evening led by her, I found a little boat tied to a willow tree within a rocky cove, its usual home. Straight I unloosened her chain and stepping in pushed from the shore. It was an act of stealth and troubled pleasure, nor without the voice of mountain echoes did my boat move on. Okay, so one summer evening led by her, I found a little boat tied to a willow tree. We have the personification of nature um, as her, as a female. Um, um, Wordsworth also personifies the boat as a her as well. And he says, I unloosened her chain. The personification of nature in the opening line obviously gives it a feminine quality. The first half of the poem, the speaker adores nature. He's happy and self-assured. And describes things, I would argue, uh, positively in terms of um, the beauty of nature and the natural world. The personification of nature as a her adds to this uh, beautiful quality. Okay, And in this way, the speaker doesn't really sound intimidated. As we know, this is going to change because by the end of the poem, the mountain frightens him. Okay, so the personification of nature as a, as a, as a female sounds beautiful. It's feminine, okay? Um, so he finds the boat straight, I unloosened her chain. Now that personification presents us with an image of the boat being trapped, okay? And, and it's almost this idea that he frees the boat by taking it uh, with him onto the lake. Perhaps it, it could e you could even argue that it is um, when he goes onto the lake and, and is surrounded by these beautiful scenes that he feels free. 
I found a little boat tied to a willow tree. We have this happy rural image of the um, the opening of the poem of the tree and the rocky cove and the summer evening. Okay, it's really tranquil and idyllic, isn't it? It sounds peaceful. Um, it was an act of stealth. Okay. It was an act of stealth. The narrator feels like he's doing something wrong. And this is the first clue that something is wrong and that something in the poem is going to change. Because if you're acting stealth, it's as if you don't want to be seen. Um, you don't want to be seen or heard by anybody. So the undertone here at the beginning of the poem, whilst we have this positive description of nature and this really serene, beautiful setting, is that the undertone is that there's something wrong. And we get that from act of stealth. And troubled pleasure. If you look at troubled pleasure, it's an oxymoron, which actually signifies the narrator's guilt at taking the boat. Okay. Again, when we're talking about him being self-assured and confident, I unloosened her chain. The confidence in his tone of voice there. Um, he, he, it's usual home. It's a familiar place. Wherever he is, it's somewhere familiar to him because, uh, because he says it's usual home. So, so far, the opening few lines, you've got the personification of nature, this beautiful, tranquil image and setting of the trees um, and the rocky cove and the shore. But then underneath that, we have the, the, the narrator's guilt of taking the boat. And actually, I suppose, a sense of foreboding that something is going to go wrong or something is going to change. Okay. The next few lines. Leaving behind her still on either side, small circles glittering idly in the moon until they melted all into one track of sparkling light. But now, like one who rose proud of his skill to reach a chosen point with an unswerving line, I fixed my view upon the summit of a craggy ridge. So, leaving behind her still, it's the idea of nature. Uh, the idea of leaving it behind. Again, if we're talking interpretation, I don't know. Sometimes the examiners do like original interpretation. Um, is he leaving? Is the speaker leaving behind a person as well? So is it is it an idea? Again, I'm just suggesting that he gets in the boat and takes off because he's trying to get away from somebody, or is it just the personification of nature? Again, this is interpretation, so it's it's whatever you feel, um, or however you interpret it. Um, small circles glittering idly in the moon until they melted all into one track of sparkling light. Um, metaphor, isn't it? That's a metaphor. It's a natural, positive image of the moon. We hear that it's glittering and sparkling and melting. This wonderful visual image, which links into the opening of the, the willow tree in the cove and the shore. Again, look at look at the beauty of nature that words with his words with his describing throughout the poem. It's idyllic, isn't it? The glittering moon melted into one track of sparkling light. It's almost mesmerising. But now, like one who rose proud of his skill to reach a chosen point with an unswerving line, I fixed my view upon the summit of a craggy ridge. So, um, proud of his skill. Like one who rose proud of his skill. The narrator seems arrogant here. Um, and he certainly won't feel like this at the end of the poem. Because remember, as I said before, the first few lines, he's very confident and self-assured, isn't he? Um, so again, here he's very arrogant um, at having taken the boat and rowed out on the lake. Um, we hear that he fixes his view upon the summit. The summit is the highest point of a mountain. So the mountain now has come into view. Okay. Um, summit also it can be the point or uh, of time at which something is at its most successful or intense. So you've got two things here. First of all, perhaps the narrator feels successful about having stolen the boat and and sailed out into the lake and seeing the mountain. All right, but it's intense. It's intense because the view of the mountain changes the speaker. I'll say that again. The ch the view of the mountain changes the speaker, as we're going to see. And this idyllic, peaceful setting that we've had for quite a few lines changes. And we're going to, it's going to change at the Volta, which I mentioned earlier. All right. So be prepared for that. Don't forget, if you do need to stop the video and make notes, uh, do so. All right.
The next few lines. The horizon's utmost boundary far above was nothing but the stars and the grey sky. She was an elfin pin pinnace. Lustily I dipped my oars into the silent lake, and as I rose upon the stroke my boat went heaving through the water like a swan, when from behind that craggy steep till then the horizon's bound a huge peak, black and huge, as if the voluntary power dis instinct. Okay, so... If we go from the the top there, the horizon's utmost boundary far above was nothing but the stars and the grey sky. We have all of a sudden an idea and a theme of emptiness here. And it contrasts with the description of the horizon on line 22. Um, which makes the appearance of the mountain more shocking. Because the, the, the mountain then contrasts with this idea of emptiness on the horizon. So this self-assured, confident, quite arrogant speaker um, is almost presented now as, as empty when he is, I think, starting to realise the power of nature. If you want to look further into that, the adjective grey, you know, has this quite dull tone to it, doesn't it? Um, again, we are building up to the volta. The volta occurs at the word when, guys. So when from behind that craggy steep, but I'm going to go into more detail about that in a minute. So when we hear there was nothing but the stars, it's 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 a feeling of emptiness, the emptiness of the speaker, I think. Um, we have a metaphor of the boat. The boat is compared to like a fairy boat, an elfin pinnace. I think I'm I think I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but you know what I mean. Um, so the metaphor compares the boat to a fairy boat, and it makes it seem magical and out of this world. Because remember. The whole poem, as said earlier, he's a romantic poet, is about nature mixed in with human emotion. And nature so far in this poem has been quite magical, hasn't it? And extremely um, formidable in the way it's described. Um, lustily, I dip my oars into the silent lake. Again, the adjective silent, the piece of nature. But again, it's the undertone of trouble, isn't it? It's quite tense, isn't it? This this idea of silence and him having to act stealthy. There's certainly some suspense building up here and some tension. Um, my boat went heaving through the water like a swan. Simile. Now, swans, it sounds graceful and confident and in control. But then the next line after that, guys, is the volta. It's at the word when. So this is when the poem changes tone. Okay, as I say, I'm going to go into more detail about that in a second. But like a swan, it's as if he's confident and he's it's as if he's in control. And again, it's this graceful image of nature. Um, I'm going to go into the Volta in more detail now. So this is the section of the Volta, okay? When from behind that craggy steep till then the horizons bound a huge peak, black and huge, as if with voluntary power instinct upreared its head. This is the turning point of the poem. It is the change in tone. This simple word is emphasised by being at the start of the line and by use, using the Sejura. Uh, if you've watched any of my other poems, I, I explain Sejura, but it is... A pause within the poetic line. All right, just to show you some examples here. So the shazura of the comma separates when, so it becomes a single word, so it's more forceful, stands out more. We know it is the change in tone, it is the volta. Your grade eight and your grade nine students, your A, your A star, your A star star certainly will need to comment on that, I believe. Um. So this is when he's going to, become threatened by nature so all of a sudden the horizon okay the horizon we are told bound huge peak black the mountain on the horizon is darker and it is threatening yeah earlier we had the horizon as being empty didn't we but now it's black the adjective black, we know, has connotations of all sorts. It has connotations of death. It has connotations of negativity. Okay, so all of a sudden, after the volta of the word when and the shazira to follow, the horizon becomes threatening. We also look, have the word power. Okay, we have the word power. And this shows us... Um, 
not only the power of nature, but the idea that the speaker is intimidated. Okay. Okay, next few lines. Upreared its head, I struck and struck again, and growing still in stature, the grim shape towered up between me and the stars, and still, for so it seemed, with purpose of its own, and measured motion like a living thing, strode after me with trembling oars, I turned, and through the silent water stole my way back to the covert of the willow tree. There, in her mooring place, I left my bark. So, upreared its head. The mountain is personified in an ugly way. Look at that word, upreared. Okay, so the mountain is personified as an ugly image. It contrasts with the earlier image of the boat being like a swan. So earlier we had this graceful image of the boat being like a swan and now we have the mountain uprearing its head. You know, upreared sounds like it's come from nowhere, it's out of place, it doesn't quite fit in with the, with the surrounding area. And we have that contrast because remember, as, as I've said a million times, we've had a change now after the Volta, the tone of the poem changes. Okay. I struck and struck again and growing still in stature. So he rose away from the mountain, guys. But as he does, more of it comes into view. So the mountain is getting bigger and it sounds like a nightmare. If you look, grim. Look at that adjective. Um, and growing still in stature, the grim shape towered up between me and the stars towered up between me and the stars again it sounds intimidating and powerful and look at the sibilance it creates a sinister tone um still in stature the grim shape towered up between me and the stars okay so it sounds intimidating and powerful and as i say a sinister tone is created it seemed with if for so it seemed with purpose of its own and measured motion like a living thing. Look at that simile. With purpose of its own and measured motion like a living thing. The mountain seems alive. It seems calm and in control. Whereas the narrator is now scared, isn't he? So earlier when the narrator was calm and in control and very confident and arrogant. Um, now he's not. But nature is. Because if you think about nature... um it's very what's the word on it it's still isn't it I mean, you know the mountains are always there really aren't they uh the sea is there um the horizon is always there it never changes so you've got this calm and in control image of nature the un the undertone for the narrator though is that he's trembling okay with trembling oars i turned the narrator's starting to feel overpowered and not arrogant anymore um so the words covert and steal, again, it's this idea that he feels guilty and wants to hide away. We have the repetition of the adjective silent. Again, I did say that silent, whilst it was peaceful earlier on, is definitely now tense and intense. Um, and through the silent water, stole my way back to the willow tree. Um, all right, so, so far we've got the negative image of the mountain, the power of the mountain, the fact that it is calm and in control, but it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and starts to sound like a nightmare, which uh, is why the narrator trembles. Your next set of lines. And through the meadows homeward went in grave and serious mood. But after I had seen that spectacle for many days, my brain worked with a dim and undetermined sense of unknown modes of being over my thoughts there hung a darkness. Call it solitude or blank desertion. No familiar shapes remained. No pleasant images of trees, of sea or sky. No colours of green fields. But huge and mighty forms that do not live like living men moved slowly through the mind by day and were a trouble to my dreams. Okay, so, um, Homer, he went in grave and serious mood. So, this event of seeing the mountain has had a massive impact on him. Grave is very negative and in this instance, means serious. Um, it reminds the speaker of his own mortality in the face of nature, the fact that he will die, okay? That, that the word grave shows us that he will die um, and, and the mountains um, and the majority of the sites he is seen won't, okay? They will remain fixed. Um, 
that spectacle for many days my brain worked with a dim undetermined sense so for many days shows the lasting impact of this event of taking the boat on the out on the lake and seeing the mountain my brain worked with a dim and undetermined sense he doesn't understand what he is saying and he can't really describe it which sounds ironic because actually he's described it very well hasn't he um, so perhaps he can't quite describe the effect um, and, and why it has affected him so much. Um, there hung a darkness, call it solitude or blank desertion. Look at that metaphor. The narrator is left feeling alone and very unsettled. Listen, look, there hung a darkness. Look at that. Um, so as I said earlier, things did change, didn't they? And start to get darker and more sinister. And this is solidified through that metaphor that his um that his thoughts uh are lonely and he feels deserted. No familiar shapes remained, no pleasant images of trees, of sea or sky, no colours. Look at the, the triple, the repetition of the word no. And he shows us that, that that the imagery and the images he have, he has seen, the beautiful tranquil images of nature do not remain anymore. So that powerful no word is repeated to show us that his ideas have changed. So just to reiterate there, no, no, and no about the shapes, the trees and the colours. The narrator no longer thinks that nature is beautiful. He has learned that it is more important and powerful than that. So it's the idea that nature, whilst it is beautiful, is actually uh, more than just to be viewed as beautiful. It's very powerful. And it's going to outlast him. Um, but huge and mighty forms that do not live like living men. So look at that simile. Nature is described as powerful and is compared to human beings. It's compared to someone who can influence our lives and that in turn supports what's happened because the viewing of the mountain has changed him. M um, moved slowly through the mind by day and were a trouble to my dreams. We finish with the unsettling image here, um, which does contrast with the beginning of the poem. Remember the beginning of the poem? We had this beautiful image of the summer evening, didn't we? And um, now we have... His dreams are troubled by what he's seen. So we are finishing with something very unsettling. Um, if his dreams have been troubled, we would argue that actually this event has turned into a nightmare. The taking the boat out onto the lake and viewing nature and viewing the mountains, which seem, seems like quite a harmless act, doesn't it really? Um, ends for him in this unsettling way because it sounds like he, when he dreams of it, it's actually a nightmare because he's troubled. And look, it moves slowly through the, through his mind every day. Okay, he's troubled by the huge and mighty forms that he has witnessed. Okay, so a little bit more about imagery because that is a massive language device in this poem, isn't it? So Wordsworth effectively describes the nighttime atmosphere with his choice of images. Small circles glittering idly in the moon until they melted all into one track of sparkling light. So as I said earlier, this wonderful image of, image of the moon, this romanticised, idyllic image of the moon glittering and melting and, um, and it was sparkling light. Okay, it's a wonderful romantic backdrop um, to, what, to, to the, the boat going out onto the lake. But as the poem progresses, the gentle moonlight becomes darkness. As the poet and narrator's state of mind becomes troubled by the end of the extract. Over my thoughts there hung a darkness, call it solitude or blank desertion. No familiar shapes remained, no pleasant images of trees, of sea or sky, no colours of green fields. This is imagery that can be associated with the gothic genre, with the tales and their nightmares and horror. It's very sinister, isn't it? Especially this idea of one darkness, two solitude, three desertion, and the idea that all of the things we associate with image Images um, have been blanked from his mind and don't exist anymore. So it almost takes a gothic tone. And Wordsworth continues with this imagery. Huge and mighty forms that do not live like living men moved slowly through the mind by day and were a trouble to my dreams. Personification is used by him. He refers to the boat as her, 
which is common uh, in literature at the time. And the mountain peak be uh, becomes alive and chases him, doesn't it? A huge peak, black and huge, as if with voluntary power instinct, upreared its head. For so it seemed with purpose of its own and measured motion like a living thing strode after me. So remember, he shows the power of the mountain and the reason it haunts him because it's this idea that it's chasing him and he roars away from the mountain, yet it gets bigger. Um, Usually... um. When we would move away from something, it would get smaller, but the mountain, the more of the mountain comes into sight, and then he realizes the full extent of, of nature and its power. And to finish, your main themes are obviously nature. Humanity is part of nature, and sometimes we can be made to feel very small and insignificant by the natural world, and that is exactly what happens in the poem. Another theme is loneliness. Wordsworth is often on his own throughout the prelude, and this is important to him. He can think more clearly and is more affected by events and places as a result. And the night. The poem seems to suggest, suggest that you can sometimes experience feelings and events more clearly at night, perhaps due to loneliness. Okay, it's quite a detailed poem. You might need to go back um, and have a look, because obviously I've said a lot about imagery, language, metaphor, the Volta, um, the Shazira. So go back and obviously uh, pause it where you need and get the notes that you need. I hope it's been useful. If you do need any more of my videos, just type Stacey Ray into YouTube. S-T-A-C-E-Y and Ray is R-E-A-Y. And good luck in your poetry exam.